Welcome back, everyone, to part two of our breakdown of Oversimplified's American Revolution. If you did not see part one of my reaction, there is a link in the description as well as a link to the original content. I'm counting on the fact that all of you have seen it by now. Uh, and so you're watching my breakdown of it to get some further information. And I would encourage you to do that with these videos. Uh, I'm not here just to react and say, wow, and amazing and stuff like that. I want to provide more detail, more in-depth analysis of these things. And so uh, I'm guessing most of you have already seen it. So let's go ahead and pick up right where we left off with part two. Washington's butt was sufficiently kicked. Winter was here. His troops' morale was low. Some just up and left. Washington needed to do something, anything to restore faith in the revolution. The British had spread throughout New Jersey and settled in for a winter of drinking cider and partying hard. No so I've actually been working on, as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, kind of an analysis of the New York and New Jersey campaign uh, for a presentation I'm doing for uh, DAR and Sons of American Revolution uh, group tomorrow. Um, yeah, uh, Washington begins the defense of New York City with something like 20,000 men. And by the time he gets to the other side of the river and you're in late December of 1776, he's down to like a couple thousand men. And many of them, their enlistments are up in about a week or so. So this is about as low as it ever is going to get for Washington and his men. And this is where the strength of George Washington is. He's not a great tactician on the battlefield, but he's a phenomenal leader. He knows how to inspire his men, and he knows how to read the room, and he understands what needs to be done here is something. Something to inspire some kind of enthusiasm, some kind of strength, some kind of confidence in the men. And that's what Trenton is going to be. Nobody expected an attack in the winter. So Washington started making plans for an attack in the winter. The British had hired a large force of Hessian mercenaries from the German states of Hesse Castle and Hesse Hanau to fight the rebels. It was these mercenaries that were stationed across the Delaware River from Washington and his army. And there were more Hessian reinforcements incoming, but they made an unscheduled stop because their commander got thirsty. No, not that kind of thirsty. That kind of thirsty. It was Christmas Eve with a blizzard outside when Washington heard the Hessian defenses were down and he decided to attack. He made a perilous crossing of the icy Delaware River with 2,400 men and marched nine miles to Trenton where he caught the Hessian forces completely off guard. So um, the plan was to attack before daylight, but it took so long to get across the river with the boats that they had. Uh, and that included transporting things like artillery. They took artillery with them on this. That by the time they arrived, I think it's about eight o'clock in the morning and it's already daylight. But they had set watches. They had, he had actually sent men to opposite sides of the town uh, and they were coordinating their efforts and they were supposed to launch uh, right, at day, uh, right at eight o'clock. And uh, it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and one of the, the men who's severely wounded nearly dies in this attack is future President James Monroe, who's a young officer at this time. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is there. He's still in command of a battery of artillery. He's a captain. Uh, and this will be really kind of his last combat that he sees until Yorktown. After a short but fierce battle, the Hessians surrendered in droves. It was a much needed victory that sent a clear message, not only to the British, but to Americans across the colonies. The Washington doesn't lose a single man killed in this attack. I think they lose a couple to the elements, to weather, um, but not a single man killed. And uh, the Hessians are just decimated. Uh, Colonel Rawl, their commander, is killed. Uh, in this attack and but the thing is what people forget is that it wasn't like washington made this attack on trenton retreated back across the river river and then settled in uh for the winter no he made further attacks and there's more fighting there's going to be a major battle at princeton where one of his commanders is going to be killed a guy named uh hugh mercer who is the great 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 grandfather of george Patton of world war ii the war was far from lost general cornwallis led the british forces south to counterattack the americans but in a series of battles washington's defensive positioning and flanking maneuvers defeated the british three times in 10 days and the british decided to abandon southern new jersey for the rest of the winter washington finally set up a winter camp in morristown but for the americans there was much less partying than the british Elsewhere, the British had taken Newport, Rhode Island, because it was a good naval base. In the south, they failed to take Charleston, South Carolina, which left British loyalists unsupported and vulnerable to more harassment and even mass expulsion. And I'm sure they'll talk more about this as the war turns to the south, but this was a civil war. Uh, it absolutely was. It was American against American. The typical way it gets described, I don't know 
if there's necessarily data to back this up exactly, but it's a fairly good assessment. Uh, you have America kind of divided in thirds. You have a third that are known as patriots that are supporting the cause of independence. You have about a third who are loyalists who want to remain loyal to the crown. And then you have another third who are just kind of in the middle and don't really take a side. They're just kind of trying to survive. Uh, but in the South, in the Carolinas in particular, the loyalist versus patriot thing is ugly. And I, myself personally, I have two direct ancestors who were loyalists who were hanged during the revolution because they were siding with the crown and they were hanged by patriots. And there were loyalists who hanged patriots. And I know in the movie, The Patriot, they kind of take this to the extreme and they show a scene where um, they round up a bunch of people in the town and put them in a church and burn the church to the ground. Nothing like that happened. But it was that ugly as far as the loyalist versus patriot thing going on. Congress sent Benjamin Franklin to France on a mission to convince them to join the war. And while the French generally loved any opportunity to hoodwink the Brits, they didn't want to join unless it was a sure win. So for now, Franklin spent his days chilling out and chasing tail. The British Parliament he couldn't totally believe did. the war wasn't over yet, and the pressure was on to end it. So the British came up with a plan. General Burgoyne in Montreal and General William Howe in New York would advance through the Hudson Valley and meet in the middle, splitting the colonies in two and thus screwing over the American communication lines. Burgoyne began his movement south, and after taking Fort Ticonderoga quite easily, he then came across heavy American resistance, so he sent Howe a dingle dongle asking if he'd be showing up anytime soon. Meanwhile, Howe had completely abandoned the plan and gone for all our personal glory by capturing the American capital, Philadelphia. Yep. He and this is probably one of the turning points of the war. Uh, certainly, Saratoga is going to be a turning point of the war, and I'm not sure Saratoga happens without Howe deciding to go grab Philadelphia. It didn't do anything. It, it might have been a little bit of a morale boost, but uh, the Continental Congress knew they were coming, so they fled. I think they go to York, and then they uh, they go to a few other towns kind of in uh, rural Pennsylvania. Um, but they're not able to hold Philadelphia, and eventually they're going to have to fall back from Philadelphia. Uh, but what he does is he screws Burgoyne, and Saratoga is going to be the thing that gets uh, the French into the war. And really, Saratoga if you ask me, is the most important battle of the American Revolution. Defeated Washington and his army at Brandywine Creek by using the old hit him with a decoy and flank him from behind tactic. And Philadelphia same thing, was now same exact tactic that was used on Washington uh, at uh, Long Island, uh, used successfully there, and Washington falls for it again. Now in British hands, forcing Congress to escape to York. But Burgoyne was left on his own to face the ever-increasing American force in Saratoga. American General Horatio Gates teamed up with our old friend Benedict Arnold to deal one final blow to Burgoyne's army. Arnold wanted to take the fight to the British, but Gates wanted to wait for the British to come to them. After a heated debate, Gates, the senior officer, told Arnold to go to his room. But Arnold defied his orders, and at the Battle of Bemis Heights, he charged at the British and obliterated them. Great job, Horatio. By the way, what happened to that other guy who was in Saratoga? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. And Arnold was pretty severely wounded and uh, kind of walked with a limp after this and, and felt like he had given his all for his country and basically Gates gets all the glory for it, which is absolutely the case. Uh, and, and people aren't going to realize that Gates isn't all that until a debacle in uh, the Carolinas shows who he really is. Hey, George, didn't I do a great job taking Philadelphia and all? Hmm? Didn't I? You're fired. Both Burgoyne and Cousin. Howe returned to Great Britain, leaving British General Henry Clinton to take charge of the war. And the war was about to take a nasty turn, because with the victory at Saratoga, the French were finally ready to join the Americans. All right, Benny, we're in. Hey, isn't this kind of funny, you know, because you're a republic trying to overthrow an absolute monarchy, and I'm an absolute monarchy helping you? Like, like, could you imagine if your revolution inspired my people to revolt against me, and then they imprisoned me and all my family, and they chopped all of our heads off? Could you imagine? And there's a whole oversimplified series on that, too. That's called foreshadowing. Yeah, that's America called foreshadowing. Did it say coming in 2027? <laughs> Listen, I, everybody jokes about the fact that Oversimplified does like two videos a year. But the fact is, look at the, the work that goes into this. And, and it's, it's super entertaining and really well done. There's a ton of work. And I think it's just two guys that do all of this. The animation, the, the script, the, the comedy, but also the research that has to go in. They do such a great job with it. Winter was here once again, which meant yet more disease, more starvation, and even a little mutiny. After losing Philadelphia, Washington's job was again on the line. But suddenly, a Prussian guy with a very fancy name, hired by Benjamin Franklin, Friedrich Wilhelm August Heinrich Ferdinand von Steuben. Uh, he was probably not all he 
portrayed himself to be, but this was happening a lot, right? Uh, in the aftermath of the Seven Years' War, there's not a lot going on in Europe at this time. And so a lot of Europeans who wanted to get experience and wanted to make a name for themselves are looking at the American Revolution as an opportunity for glory. And so you have constantly, you have these Ger these Prussians and, um, and other Germans, you've got Frenchmen showing up with letters of introduction from people like Benjamin Franklin and others saying, give me a position. And all these guys were like showing up and, and expecting to be made like major generals in Washington's army. And Washington's got to kind of constantly deal with this. And one of the guys is this, you know, this young guy, Marquis de Lafayette. I think his full name was Gil Gilbert Roche du Motier, uh, Marquis de Lafayette. And Lafayette's going to be one of the few guys who shows up who not only gets a position uh, of authority, but actually proves that he was worth it and is going to be one of Washington's best generals during the war. But von Steuben's one of these guys who kind of misrepresents himself a little bit, but really does uh, bring a lot of value to Washington. And he's, he's made, I think, Inspector General, which is one of the highest ranking uh, offices you can have. And there's a reason why there's so many places named after him today. We've got Steubenville, just an hour away from me, which is named after von Steuben. Franklin showed up out of nowhere and said, hey, I'm here to give your men a European military training. And train them he did. They yep. learned how to shoot accurately, how to march in formation, where to poop and where not to, and strict... And don't underestimate this. And this is the kind of thing that Washington should have already been doing. I think Washington probably did do to a point. But uh, there's something about... If you're a parent, you know how this goes, right? You tell your kids something over and over again, and they kind of start tuning you out, and then somebody else tells them the same thing, and they listen the first time. I think maybe there's a part of that with this, right? This this German guy who doesn't speak any English, and they actually, the way they translated for von Steuben, they did have some German-speaking guys, and, and, you know, because Pennsylvania is heavily populated by Germans, a lot of German-Americans fighting for the, the cause. But what they ended up doing was von Steuben spoke French, and Alexander Hamilton is on the staff of General Washington, and he speaks fluent French. And so he would actually translate by speaking French to von Steuben and then speak English to everybody. But this was really important because this is about sanitation. And, and what kills more men in an army than bullets? Disease does. Punishments were handed out to any who didn't comply. Washington's army came out of the winter in 1778, a new and improved force, ready to take Philadelphia yep. back from the British. In the end, though, they didn't have to. With the French entry into the war, the British ordered General Clinton to evacuate Philadelphia and consolidate all of the British forces in New York. So Washington sent Benedict Arnold to reoccupy and secure the city as he pursued the British through New Jersey on land, eventually finding a good opportunity to attack at Monmouth Courthouse. The battle took place on a sweltering hot summer's day, and as many soldiers died from heat stroke as they did from battle. In the end, a thousand soldiers die in a hundred degrees heat as we snatch a stalemate from the jaws of defeat. Sorry, my Hamilton is coming back on it. Uh, so Charles Lee, who had been placed by Washington in command of the defenses of New York while Washington was still up in Boston, um, is captured by the British. And there's a lot of people that suspect that maybe during that time that he was captured by the British, that he was turned by the British. Because remember, Charles Lee had been a British officer years before. Um, and so Lee is freed, and he comes back, and Washington comes up with this plan to pursue the British as they retreat across, uh, across New Jersey back to New York. And Washington wants to hit the British, and Lee is opposed to this plan, vehemently opposed. And Lee thinks that he should be in command of the American army, that Washington's an idiot, uh, this country bumpkin that was a colonial soldier that has no business leading a, a, a nation's army. Uh, but then when Washington says, fine, well, if you don't believe in this plan, I'll put somebody else in command. Lee says, no, 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 I'm, I'm second in command of your army. I should have the honor of doing this. And then he completely botches the attack and orders the men to retreat. And so Washington comes along and berates him uh, and it swears in front of the men and shows his temper and, and replaces Lee on the spot on the battlefield. And after some incompetence slash borderline treason from Washington's second in command, it was a draw. And in this war, a draw is kind of a victory for the Americans. Yeah. Next up. This is the first time that the Americans show that in a pitched battle face to face, 
uh, that they can stand with the British. It's a big deal. Let's talk about this guy. This is John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones is handsome, Scottish, and absolutely insane. When the war first broke out, everyone... And I think his real name was actually John Paul. He added the Jones later. Absolutely insane is a good way to put it. It was like, how did the colonies expect to stand up to the might of the British Navy with their meager fleet of converted merchantmen? Yep, try telling that to John Paul Jones. This guy sailed to the British Isles, somehow captured a British ship off the coast of Ireland, and brought it back to France. Then he returned, attacking more ships, raiding towns, and evading capture the entire time. These are basically pirate tactics. But hey, if it works... It works. In one incident, he captured a British ship and returned to a Dutch port without an official ensign because his was lost during the battle. That's a big no-no and can have you arrested as a pirate. The Dutch helped him out by quickly creating a design based on Benjamin Franklin's description of what the American flag should look like, and they entered it into their records as an official US flag. What they came up with looks pretty cool. The whole campaign probably played cool. heavily on British morale and brought into question their ability to win the war. And here's the thing. There's a couple of things about the nature of how this war was going to be won. Number one, the Americans were never going to win it by defeating the British army on the battlefield, right? They could win battles, but the way to win this war, and they, again, going back to Hamilton, there's this song where uh, Washington says, out, uh, outrun, outlast, hit him quick, get out fast. Uh, stay alive until this horror show is past. We're going to fly a lot of flags half-mast. Um, and the idea was you have to stay alive. You have to last until you get enough help from the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, until the British public turns against this. Uh, and there's a line in Hamilton again where they say, we're, um, make it impossible to justify the cost of the fight. And that's what it's going to take in the end, is you have to get to the place where the British are done pouring resources, lives, and money into holding on to these colonies. That's how they're going to win. And fun fact, he was so cool that one of the towns he raided in 1778 gave him an official honorary pardon in 1999. Keep ripping in heaven, John Paul Jones. Keep ripping in heaven. And uh, if, if you're not too squeamish about such things... John Paul, Paul Jones, when he died, I think he was buried in like Paris or something. Uh, he he was buried like in a, I think a lead coffin that was filled with alcohol, uh, and then they exhumed him like a hundred or so years ago. And there are actually pictures of John Paul Jones' mummified body. Like you can still see his long hair and everything. If you're not easily squeamish about such things, you can Google it and see those. You're an angel now. What the Continental Navy was lacking in resources though, the French entry into the war made up for. The French began with naval skirmishes in the English Channel, and they sent a large fleet to America, although it sustained a lot of damage in a storm off Rhode Island. The Americans were hoping for a bigger commitment from the French, so John Adams went to France to help Benjamin Franklin continue negotiations. Oh good, you're finally here. Check this out. Hey ladies, I'd like to fly you like a kite, cause you're electrifying. <laughs> Isn't this great? Is this? Is this what you've been doing? Watch John Adams, the, the HBO series, which is fantastic, by the way. Uh, and they do such a great job with attention to detail that if you ever get the chance to visit the Adams home, Peacefield, uh, in Quincy, Massachusetts, you'll immediately recognize scenes from that in uh, John Adams because they, they really got it down well. But you see all of this play out when Adams shows up in France and he sees Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin's very good with relating to the French culture and Adams feels completely out of his depth there. Yeah, why? We were sent here on a diplomatic mission to secure military support from France, not to philander with the locals. Wait, no, ladies, come back. <sighs> Worst wingman Worst ever. Worst wingman I remember that ever. line. But the Americans would get some more help. The Dutch provided aid, although they never formed an official alliance. Money. More significantly, though, the Spanish, who had already been providing aid, officially joined the war in June 1779. They would provide support in the Midwest and the Gulf Coast, campaigns that heavily impacted the Native American tribes in those areas. Both sides actually enlisted the help of Native American tribes throughout the war, sometimes even pitting those tribes against each other. Yeah. In the summer of 1779, after a series of raids against the Americans by the Iroquois, Washington organized an expedition that burned down more than 40 villages, forcing the tribes to relocate to Canada for British protection. And another group that shouldn't go unmentioned were African Americans, both free and enslaved. Yep. They joined both sides of the war, hoping to gain their freedom. But afterwards, many were simply returned to slavery. Yeah, um, one of the really sad chapters in uh, American history is how many of these, these black men fought. And this is the last time until the Korean War that 
Uh, you're going to have integrated units, enlisted black men and enlisted white men fighting side by side in the same unit. It won't happen again until Korea. By the way, I just this morning was uh, on Paramount Plus. They have the movie Devotion now uh, on there. Fantastic. And I'm going to be doing a video on that story very soon. Um, but yeah. Um, and one of the things we need to talk about, too, is that uh, I mentioned yesterday that there was more than just taxation without representation at stake here. You have the beginning stages of what will be called manifest destiny at play as well. Uh, the British had treaties in place with many of the Native American tribes to where uh, the Appalachian Mountains are kind of the dividing line and, and they're not, settlers are not supposed to settle west. They can go there like fur trapping and hunting and things like that, but they're not to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. And so places like where I live in Ohio, Northeast Ohio, was kind of off limits uh, to British settlers. But the Americans wanted to be able to settle in those areas. And so all of the states, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, etc., kind of claimed the land west of there. And one of the ways that America will rapidly grow is that these men who serve in the American Revolution are going to be promised land grants after the war west of the Appalachians. And so places like Kentucky, for example, are heavily settled by veterans of the revolution because they're given these grants of land afterward. Those who had fought for the Americans. Despite owning slaves himself, Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration yep. of Independence. True. But out of fear of offending the southern colonies, this was removed from the final draft. For the same reason, the American army stopped enlisting African-American men in 1775, a policy that Washington, a slave owner himself, supported. But they yep. were forced to reverse the policy after the British promised freedom to any slaves who joined them. In general, you stood a better chance of gaining freedom if you fought for the British. True. However, even those that left with the British after the war suffered mistreatment and discrimination in their new lives outside of America. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is now in charge of Philadelphia, having a good time, partying down with, and even marrying a member of the Philadelphia elite. The same elite that had partied down with the British when they controlled the city. And suddenly, the people of Philadelphia, including the state governor, started accusing Arnold of having pro-British sentiments to keep the people happy. And not only pro-British sen sen sentiments, but even more than that, he was accused of using his position to make himself wealthy. And those accusations were probably true. And Washington comes along, and he he knows that Arnold's a good soldier. He's a good leader. And so he has to deal with Arnold, but he also doesn't want to lose him. But he reprimands him. And unfortunately, even though Washington saw reprimanding Arnold as kind of a slap on the wrist, it was the final straw in Arnold's mind. Washington wrote a letter rebuking Arnold, calling his conduct imprudent and improper. Which it and was. And that was too many ouchies for Benedict Arnold to handle. He asked Washington to put him in charge of the fort at West Point. Then he contacted the British, offering to hand the plans of the fort over to them. And, and why does West Point matter? West Point, first of all, it's the same West Point where our military academy is today. But it's a super important fort on the Hudson River, which the Hudson River is... It's the Mississippi in the American Civil War. It's it's that vital because it connects north and south, you know, Canada down to New York City. It connects east and west with uh, New England and the rest of the states. And he intentionally gets control of that fort uh, and then basically weakens it as much as possible and is connecting with the adjutant general of the British Army, a guy named John Andre, whose grave I just got to visit in Westminster Abbey. Uh, and I did a video on Andre uh, and how he was captured during all of this. I'll put a link in the description and also up at the end of the video uh, from Tapan, New York, where all of this went down. And join their side. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is our good friend no more. Luckily, the treasonous plans were discovered on a captured British officer, but Arnold managed to escape before he was arrested. As a British brigadier general, he would go on to lead raids against American cities, most notably his raid of Richmond, Virginia in 1781. His betrayal shook George Washington, who had once again set up camp at Morristown. And Washington was understandably very angry and wanted Arnold. When they captured John Andre, who had been in civilian clothes, um, but Adjutant General of the Army, even though he was only a major, he's probably the most important major uh, in the British Army. And it was a big, big deal that they were going to put him on trial for spying. Um, but what he really wanted was Arnold. And he offered Andre to General Clinton in exchange for Arnold. But Clinton wouldn't do it because he knew if he gave Arnold up, he'd never be able to turn another American officer again. 
Uh, and so Andre was put on trial, and he was found guilty, and he was hanged for spying. But they really wanted Arnold. His leadership somehow held the Continental Army together through the harshest winter of the war. We're entering 1780, and Parliament was hopping mad that the war still wasn't over. The British debt was soaring, and despite taking parts of Massachusetts in late 1779, the North was in a stalemate, so the British decided to make a major shift in strategy to the South, an yep. economically rich area with a higher level of support for the British, or so the British thought. A year earlier, they had captured the underdefended city of Savannah, Georgia easily, and a joint American-French counter siege failed. Now, they laid siege to Charleston, South Carolina. It fell within months, with thousands of American troops surrendering to the British. A yeah, something like 5,000 Americans are lost to um, to either kill uh, or captured in, in Charleston. This was a big, big deal and almost cost them the war. By the time you get to 1780 uh, and into 1781, both sides are like this close to losing the war. Uh, the British not so much losing as having to give up the fight because of public sentiment back home. And it'll end up being Yorktown that pushes them over the edge. But the Americans are super close, too. Costly defeat. The British quickly moved to take control, and they sent stereotypical Hollywood villain with a British accent, Bannister the Butcher Tarleton. In Tarleton is the inspiration for the character of Tavington in the movie The Patriot, played brilliantly by Jason Isaacs, by the way, who I think is fantastic in any role that he takes on. To the backcountry, where he hunted down rebels and destroyed them with ruthless brutality. The British presence also inspired local loyalist militias in the backcountry to rise up against their persecutors. Yep. The British really seemed to be onto something with their new strategy, and the ball was very much in Washington's court. I'm going to send my most loyal general, Nathaniel Green, to the south to stop the British. Going to have to overrule you there, George. We're sending Hero of Saratoga and your biggest rival, Horatio Gates. What? And like I said in yesterday's episode, one thing that Washington's very good at is recognizing talent and putting people in positions where they can be successful. He knew Nathaniel Green was one of his best generals. And there is a reason why so many states have towns named Greenville. My daughter was born in Greenville, Pennsylvania, in Mercer County. Those are both named after American generals. Uh, and he recognized that Gates was not the guy. And you'll see why in a minute. Watch this, George. I'm going to save the day again. Everybody will love me, and I'm going to get your job. Here I go. And he got into one battle with Cornwallis, got annihilated, and ran away. Alrighty. And not just ran away, but fled. I'm talking like... A hundred miles from his army within a couple of days. That's what Horatio Gates does. And so Gates is di disgraced and he's out of the war at this point. So now they'll go with Green. And Green understands that he's got to deploy an outrun, outlast strategy which is what he was instructed to do by Washington, and he pulls it off brilliantly. Let's go with your guy. Nathaniel Green knew the British outnumbered his own forces and wouldn't be defeated with conventional tactics, so he had to think outside the box. He split his army into two. Dan said, Morgan. Hey, big boy, look at me. And then they went running in two different directions. Cornwallis sent Tarleton after Morgan, and he caught up with him at Cowpens, where Morgan proceeded to kick Tarleton's butt. And Daniel Morgan had also been at Braddock's expedition with uh, George Washington, Horatio Gates, Charles Lee... William uh, or Thomas Gage, all those guys. Then the two led Cornwallis on a wild chase through North Carolina. His bigger and better equipped army much heavier and slower than Green's quick and mobile troops. Green led Cornwallis further and further from his supply line, then crossed the Dan River into Virginia, picked up some reinforcements, and turned back to face the now exhausted Guilford British. Courthouse. At the Battle of yep. Guilford Courthouse, the two sides engaged in vicious close combat. Cornwallis, fearing loss, fired his big guns into the chaotic fighting, cutting down many of his own men. Green retreated, giving Cornwallis the victory, but Cornwallis lost a quarter of his men in the fighting, so it felt much more like a British defeat. At this point, both sides desperately needed something to happen soon to end the fighting. The British were running out of money, while the Americans were again facing mutinies. As the This is what I was talking about. Both sides are right at their limit, right? And then they're having these, these mutinies start happening because Congress isn't paying the soldiers. And so the first mutiny happens, and Washington kind of gets them to stand down, but then another mutiny happens. And this time, Washington has to make an example. And so the uh, ringleaders are sentenced to death and they're sentenced to be executed, to be shot by their own men who were with them. Uh, and they, they show this scene in turn, Washington spies. I think that's where they show it. And they actually make the guy, like the first group of men fire and miss deliberately. So then they make them get up super close 
and fire and execute these ringleaders. The men went without pay or even basic living needs. Fortunately, the French were now showing up in greater numbers and were ready to fight. After his encounter with Green, Cornwallis decided the only way to win the South was to first prevent the Southern Continental Army from using Virginia as a supply base. So he abandoned the Carolinas, moving to Wilmington and onto Yorktown, a position the British believed would be easy to supply and support. On his march to Yorktown, he raided many farms, stealing horses and supplies from the locals, but also freeing thousands of slaves, many of whom joined him. The French saw Cornwallis' new position as an opportunity to land a decisive blow on the British. Washington wanted to attack Clinton in New York, but the French said it was a really dumb idea. And to be fair, it was. In yeah, Washington all along had wanted to get New York back. And uh, on one hand, it's a criticism of Washington that he was so stubbornly insistent on going after New York. But on the other hand, you have to give him credit that he finally gave in. And the way that they leave New York and pull the men down to Yorktown is brilliant. This is something Washington is good at. He's not a good tactician on the battlefield, but strategy-wise and in terms of deception and the use of espionage, Washington was fantastic. And they really trick Henry Clinton in New York uh, until it's too late. Instead, Washington sent out fake dispatches to make it look like they would attack Clinton, but secretly their combined force marched all the way down to Virginia. A large French fleet under the command of Comte de Grasse arrived and successfully cleared the British Navy out of the Chesapeake Bay. The combined land and naval forces then laid siege to Cornwallis' army in Yorktown. The American and French forces tightened in around the city, raining artillery down on Cornwallis who desperately appealed to Clinton for aid, but Clinton was unusually chilled out about the whole thing. Cornwallis held out for nearly a month before he had no choice but to surrender. Yeah, that's uh, the unsung part of this whole story with Yorktown is, number one, it's about the French fleet. The French fleet winning that battle of the Chesapeake is kind of the... That's the end for Cornwallis' forces. Uh, that and the fact that Clinton delayed in coming to his aid, which he had promised all along, and that was what Cornwallis was counting on. Cornwallis gets all the grief for it, but it really wasn't his fault in the end. Over 7,000 British troops were captured, a crushing defeat. And with that, Parliament had... Uh, and Cornwallis says he's indisposed uh, during all of this, so he sends his second-in-command, uh, O'Hara, to surrender on his behalf. And so then Washington has his second in command. I think it was Benjamin Lincoln received the surrender. And O'Hara, I think Charles O'Hara was his name. Um, you see him portrayed in The Patriot as kind of the sidekick to um, Cornwallis. O'Hara has the distinct honor of being the only guy to surrender to George Washington and to Napoleon. He'll end up having to surrender to Napoleon a few years later on had reached the end of its rope. The war just wasn't worth it, and it needed to end now. The British still held New York, Charleston, and Savannah, but fighting between the two sides mostly ceased as peace negotiations opened up in Paris. The yeah, the, the war, everybody thinks the war ends in October of 1781 with uh, Yorktown, but the war's not over. It, it doesn't end until 1783 uh, with the Treaty of Paris. In the meantime, they're still fighting. Guys like, um, guys like, uh, Alexander Hamilton's friend John Lawrence, who is the son of Henry Lawrence, who was the Con Continental Congress president at one time and ends up getting held in the Tower of London. Uh, Lawrence is killed in a battle in South Carolina that happens after Yorktown. Uh, Lawrence was at Yorktown, helped write the surrender documents. Uh, battle of Blue Licks, Kentucky, one of my, my fifth great grandfather, um, James Felix McGuire uh, is a lieutenant at the Battle of Blue Lips, Kentucky. He's killed at that battle. That happens after Yorktown. Daniel Boone loses a son at Blue Licks. That's sometimes considered the last major battle of the American Revolution. So fighting continues, and the British occupy New York City till 1783. The resulting treaty in 1783 saw Great Britain remove its troops from American soil, recognize U.S. independence, and cede territory up to the Mississippi River. In return, the Americans agreed to pay any debt still owed to Britain and gave fair treatment to any colonists who had remained loyal to the crown. The Spanish got Florida, while the French got an economic crisis that led to its own revolution a decade later. Washington retired to his home in Mount Vernon, wishing his men farewell by saying, I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. Yeah, uh, I was a... Uh described as a very sad occasion for Washington saying goodbye to these men that he had remember this war at this point has gone on for eight years uh, it was one of the longest wars in American history and um, speaking of the French Revolution a couple of the French uh, higher-ups who were very instrumental 
in helping the Americans win the war, they suffer in the French Revolution. Lafayette, his wife, her grandmother, mother, and sister are all going to go to the guillotine, as well as uh, Admiral d'Estaing, who was a, a French admiral who, again, helped out tremendously during the war. Uh, he's going to be guillotined during all of this. He hoped to live out the rest of his days in peace. But unfortunately for him, a number of people wanted him to be the first leader of the new country. And by a number of people, I mean literally Everybody. everyone. The first election campaign in American history was basically a grassroots effort Effort to convince Washington to accept the office. He was sworn in on April 30th, 1789, and he himself established many of the standards and limitations yep. of what the American leader should be. First of all, there was debate on what he should be called. Is he a king? Is he our glorious leader? In the end, they went for a word that at the time was pretty modest. President, like the president of your local bowling club yep. or office bake sale committee. He set up a cabinet of expert advisors knowing that no president could know everything, no matter how much of a stable genius they claimed to be. He proposed major legislation to Congress and gave an annual State of the Union address to keep his own power in check. He stated that the U.S. should remain neutral in foreign conflicts. And in the end, he voluntarily gave up his power yeah. after just two terms. He could... So, and we've talked about this in other videos, but so many of the things that Washington did to set the precedent for what a president should be and should not be, uh, vitally important. And just one more reason why he was the guy at the right time and the right place for our country. He could have made the presidency anything he wanted, but his careful and cautious actions helped set the precedent of an office that is powerful in its limitations, decisive through its diplomacy, and respected in its humility. And so the United States was born, and everything was perfect. It had no problems, not a single one. Certainly nothing that would, I don't know, cause such an extreme divide that it would lead to Slavery. a civil war. Anyway, moving on. I want to, real quick, before we finish up this video, I want to read to you a little bit of Washington's farewell address when he left the office of president because it's brilliant and it's beautiful. And it was written, at least in part, by Alexander Hamilton. There's a lot to it, and he warns about like factions, he warns against parties, he warns against infighting, he warns us to remain neutral, he passes on all these really important concepts, but I love how he ends this. It says, though, in reviewing the incidents of my administration, I am unconscious of intentional error, I am nevertheless too sensible of my defects, not to think it probable that I may have committed many errors. Whatever they may be, I fervently beseech the Almighty to avert or mitigate the evils to which they may tend. I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will never cease to view them with indulgence, and that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will soon be consigned to oblivion, as myself must soon be to the mansions of rest." Relying on its kindness in this as in other things, and actuated by the fervent love toward it, which is so natural to a man who views it in the native soil of himself and his progenitor, uh, progenitors for several generations, I anticipate with pleasing expectation that retreat in which I promise myself to realize without alloy the sweet enjoyment of partaking in the midst of my fellow citizens the benign influence of good laws under a free government, the ever favorite object of my heart, and the happy reward as I trust our mutual cares, labors, and dangers, George Washington. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, and I encourage you to read the entire farewell address if you ever get the opportunity. Some, some advice that our country desperately could use at any time in our history. Good stuff. All right, so we're going to wrap it up right there. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I want to give a big thank you uh, to all of our patrons who support this channel and make it possible to, uh, for me to continue to make content the way that I do. Please definitely check out Oversimplified. If you haven't seen all their videos, check out every single one. It's worth your time and you'll learn a lot in the process. Thanks for watching.